So we have a discharge lamp emits light of four colours, red, green, blue and violet. Figure 12 shows the light from the lamp incident normally on a diffraction grating. OK, so if we're considering a diffraction grating, we're most likely going to be using this equation at some point, n lambda is d sine theta, with slit separations of 1.8 times 10 to the minus 6, so this is d. The light is viewed through a telescope, which can be rotated as shown. As the telescope is rotated from the straight through position, each of the four colours, so these ones, is observed as a bright line at its corresponding first order diffraction angle. So that means that we're considering n to be 1. Which colour would be observed first as the telescope is rotated from the straight through position? OK, so we're considering n lambda is d sine theta. So the wavelength is changing. Each of these different colours has different wavelengths. We're trying to see which colour would be observed first as the telescope is rotated. So in other words, for which wavelength would theta be the smallest? So that's what that means. Observed first would mean that theta would be the smallest. OK, so let's think about what's constant, what's changing in our equation. So we're looking at the first order diffraction angle. So n is just 1, that's fixed. And also, we're told that d is equal to this. So d is also fixed. So n and d are constant. So that would mean that from the equation that we have here, we can say that lambda is proportional to sine theta. So then we want to figure out, from this proportionality, which wavelength would correspond to the smallest value of theta. So we have lambdas proportional to sine theta. If theta were to decrease, that would mean that sine theta decreases as well. That's not true for all theta values, but because for our diffraction grating, we're only going from 0 to 90 degrees. So if I go back to the image here, the telescope can only be rotated 90 degrees. You wouldn't get diffraction past that angle. So theta has to be between 0 and 90, so we're considering this portion of the graph here. So we can see that as theta increases, as we go towards the right, sine theta increases as well. So if one goes down, the other goes down, and vice versa. So if theta is to go down, sine theta must go down, and therefore lambda must also go down. So what does that mean? That means that the colour that would be observed first, which would be again when theta is the smallest, would be the wavelength that is the shortest, and that would be violet light. For part b, explain how a bright line is formed by the diffraction grating at the first order diffraction angle. Okay, so again, n is equal to 1. We're trying to explain how a bright line is formed. So I'm going to draw a diagram of a diffraction grating and light passing through this diffraction grating. So here is the grating, let's say. And then I'm going to draw, these are my slits, all equally spaced. And let's say our rays travel at an angle. So I'm going to try and draw all of these parallel to one another. The angle the rays make to the horizontal, or to the perpendicular to the grating, that's probably a better way of putting it, is theta. That's the same theta as the theta in n lambda is equal to d sine theta. And then I'm going to draw another line, which is perpendicular to all of them from this top position here. And I'll explain why in a sec. So first of all, to start off our question, explain how a bright line is formed by the diffraction grating. So when light passes through the slits, the light diffracts. So it spreads out. So you can imagine that from each of these slits for our diffraction grating, as light goes through, we see wave fronts like this as the light spreads out in multiple different directions. So I've drawn the rays, the blue lines, they represent the rays traveling in a particular direction towards a certain maximum. Now, because the rays, or rather because the distance between the slits or the adjacent slits, so this distance here, is significantly smaller than the distance from the grating as a whole to the screen, then that means that these rays are all approximately parallel. They're all traveling to the same point, don't forget. They're all traveling to the nth order maximum. So if these distances are small, the distance between adjacent slits, compared to the distance from the grating to the screen, then these rays are approximately parallel. And if that still doesn't make sense, if you think about, 
let's say two points, two light sources, they're traveling to some distant point over here. Well, as you can see, the two rays are not parallel. But if I were to make the two points same distance apart, or roughly the same distance apart, and then put my meeting point further away, then we can see that the rays start to get, at least, a bit more parallel. And if you imagine this getting very far away compared to this distance here, then the two rays will be approximately parallel. Okay, so that's relevant because if we go back to this diagram here, that's relevant because now with the line that I have here, this dashed line, which I've tried to draw in such a way that it's perpendicular to the rays, that would mean that this distance here is the path difference, the difference in distance traveled for these two rays as they meet at some point further away. So this is the path difference. This bottom ray has traveled an extra distance of this. And if the angle here is theta, well, that would mean that this angle here is also theta. And if you're not entirely sure why, well, this angle is 90. And therefore, this angle here, so that angle meaning considering this triangle there. If this is 90, and if this is theta, then the angle here must be 90 minus theta. And then considering this triangle, where the angle that we have here is also 90, then because the three angles that we have, this one, this one, and this one, must add up to make 180, this angle at the top must therefore be theta. Okay, so zooming in to the triangle that we have over here. There it is. So this distance is d. That's the separation between two adjacent slits. This would be theta. And using Sokoto, this would be d sine theta. So when you have the two slits, the two adjacent slits, the rays coming from them, so these two rays here, when the path difference, which is this distance, on this, dif on this diagram it's this distance, when that path difference is equal to one lambda, or rather more generally n lambda, that's when you have constructive interference, or max constructive interference. When the path difference is n lambda, that's when you have max constructive interference. d sine theta is the path difference between two adjacent rays. So that means that these two rays here will be interfering constructively, maximally as well. But it also means that this ray and this ray will be interfering constructively because this triangle has the same angles as this triangle here. The only difference is that this triangle has a longer, has twice as long a length here, twice as long a length there, and therefore twice as long a length here. So for the smaller triangle, if this distance, the path difference between these two rays, is one wavelength, that would mean that the path difference between this ray and this ray, which is that distance would be two wavelengths, basically just doubling this length. If this is one lambda, this will be two lambda. So that means that if the path difference between these two rays is n lambda, the path difference between these two rays will be two n lambda, the path difference between this ray and this ray will be three n lambda, and so on. So basically, all of the rays will have an integer multiple of wavelength of path difference, and therefore they all interfere constructively. Okay, so how does this relate to our question? We start off by saying, as light passes through each of the slits, the light diffracts and then superposes and interferes on the screen. And now we bring in the theory that I was just talking about. When the path difference between two adjacent rays is one lambda, not n lambda, but one lambda, because we're looking at the first order diffraction angle. So when the path difference between two adjacent rays is one lambda, then all of the rays will have maximum constructive interference they will be in phase, and you will have a bright line being formed by your diffraction grating. And for C part one, the wavelength of the green light is 5.3 times 10 to the minus seven. So this is lambda. Calculate the first order diffraction angle, so we're trying to work out, again, when n is equal to 1, we're trying to work out the angle, so theta. So n lambda is d sine theta. 
We're trying to work out theta, so I'll rearrange for that. Sine theta is equal to n lambda over d. Theta is inverse sine of n lambda over d. So n is 1, we know that, we know lambda. And then from the previous question, we know that d is equal to 1.8 times 10 to the minus 6. So I'll write that down here. So our equation then becomes inverse sine of 1 times lambda all over 1.8, 10 to the minus 6. Type this in, and we end up with 17. 0.12. Now everything in this question is given to two sig figs by the looks of it. 1.8, and then we have our wavelength over here as well, 5.3. So our final answer, 17 degrees, two sig figs. See part two, final part. Okay, so as the telescope is rotated further, higher order diffraction maxima are observed. Calculate the highest order observed for green light. Okay, so green light was what we had before, wasn't it? Yeah, so green light, the wavelength of that was 5.3 times 10 to the minus 7. So I'll just put that down here. Lambda is 5.3, 10 to the minus 7. And also from earlier, we still have d. d is the same value of 1.8 times 10 to the minus 6. Okay, so we're trying to work out the highest order observed. If we consider this equation, n lambda is equal to d sine theta, Sine theta has a range, so here's a sine graph. Remember that from earlier we were talking about how the angle theta can only go between 0 and 90. So that's this portion of the graph. So that means that sine theta cannot be bigger than 1 and also can't be negative, it can't be less than 0. So we know that sine theta is less than or equal to 1. It's also greater than or equal to 0, but that kind of goes without saying. In this scenario, when we rearrange this equation, sine theta is equal to n lambda over d. So if I rearrange that for this, we can replace the sine theta here with n lambda over d. And again, it goes without saying that n lambda over d is greater than or equal to 0 because all of these quantities are positive. So we can just rewrite this inequality as n lambda over d is less than or equal to 1. So that was just, if you're not sure, I just replaced the sine theta with this because the two things are equal. And then I can say that n must be less than or equal to rearranging d over lambda. So this tells us that n cannot be any bigger than d over lambda. Well, if we put in d over lambda into this, so d was 1.8, 10 to the minus 6, put in lambda as well, 5.3, 10 to the minus 7, that gives uh, 3.39, so 3.4. So n has to be less than or equal to 3.4. So therefore, well, n is an integer. Remember, it's the order number, so it can only be an integer. The highest order will therefore be 3.